Hi guys, Buildzoid here, and today we're going to be taking a look at another 12th gen CPU overclock. This time it is on the MSI-Z690 Torpedo EKX board. Uh, it's the 12600KF CPU that I have. Uh, it's being cooled by a 240mm Asetek AIO. I know it says Arctic on there, but this is before... So if you buy a new Arctic, like, Liquid Freezer 2 AIO, those aren't made by Asetek anymore. This this is an Asetek design with a slightly thicker than standard 240mm uh, radiator. I have push-pull fans on it. Um, it's completely thermally maxed out by the 12600KF in its current configuration, especially since I'm running Prime95 on all of the cores, including the E-cores, with AVX256. So it is getting very hot. Um, the CPU is. The board, unfortunately, isn't. <laughs> the CPU doesn't, like, th this is the thing with, like, the s shrinking manufacturing processes, is it gets very hard to cool relatively small amounts of power. Like, the, the CPU is currently only pulling around 250 watts of power, which is not much as far as I'm concerned. Like, that really isn't a lot of power, but uh, it, it, well, actually, it's kind of comparable to, like, a 5950X, and it's similarly difficult to cool. Imagine that. Um, anyway, so, uh, yeah, and the setup here, so, yeah, we've got the AIO, we've got this pink foam over here to basically block airflow from the radiator from reaching the VRM, because I want this to be, like, a v passive VRM configuration, right? Like, Ultimately, I will be running the motherboard in an actual case um, for the, like, custom loop tests with the, uh, like, a regular CPU block and then a mono block. But I wanted to do a quick pre-test before I go, you know, installing everything inside the case because if things don't quite work out the way I want them to, I'd be kind of annoyed that I have to then take everything back out. I'm extremely lazy, so, uh, yeah, I've decided to do this pre-test. And as part of that, I decided, hey, let's just see what kind of frequency it maxes out at. Um, and so we'll also have some interesting data to see if, like, moving from the AIO to the custom loop, uh, translates into better overclocks. I, I think it will, because AIO, like, a lot of people think AIOs are, like, comparable to custom loops, but especially something like this, which is, like, a first, like, not really, like, it's just a pretty basic a Asetek AIO, um, yeah, this is more like a giant air cooler than it is, like, a custom loop. So, we'll, we'll see if I'm right about that, though. Because the thing is, at the same time, the CPU doesn't actually produce that much heat. So, it, the, you know, if the if the bottleneck here is the thermal density, then maybe the, the cooler replacement won't make that much of a difference. But I'm, I'm hoping to see an improvement when we move over to the custom loop configurations. Um, anyway, uh, what else is there? That's kind of it. There's RAM in there, but that's just running JDEC. Um, and there's the GT1030. So... Let's take a look at the uh, settings in the OS. So as you can see, it's been running Prime95 for the last hour and like 55 minutes, except some idiot forgot to reset the statistics, didn't he? Yes, he did. <laughs> so, I mean, our average, average CPU load is 127%. So obviously this CPU has been working very, very hard for the majority of the time that it's been running. Right, for like the majority of the time that Hardware Info has been running, and Hardware Info has been open for an hour and 56 minutes, so yeah, it's been basically running Prime95 for the majority of that hour and 56 minutes. The cooling system here is very much the bottleneck for, for overclocking the CPU. The CPU is currently maxed out at like 5 gigahertz, and it is actually maxed out. If I try to raise the frequency for specifically for Prime95, if I was running something less intensive, uh, then it wouldn't, you know, like we'd have head, like we'd have thermal headroom. But as it is, um, the CPU is just under 100 degrees Celsius, and I did try, like, 5.05 uh, gigahertz um, by raising the BCLK, and the thing is, at 5.05 gigahertz, it needs a little, like, it basically needs too much voltage. It eventually goes over 100 degrees, and then it just starts getting horribly unstable very, very quickly. Um... Because, yeah, like, I even went and raised the thermal throttle limit to see if, like, hey, you know, would enough, would more voltage perhaps... No, more voltage does... in the, Like, this is maxed out. Like, I've I've tried all the way up to 1.42 volts, and it just doesn't make a difference. Um, so, yeah, this, this is very much limited by the cooling setup here. Um, so that's the P cores at 5 gigahertz, which is admittedly more than you get, like, stock boost frequency out of a 12600KF if you run it at, like, stock settings. Um, also, I should note that this CPU is slightly above average for silicon quality on 12600K chips. Um, 
But uh, I'll have another more detailed video about silicon quality for 12th gen chips um, later. Um, hopefully, might even get that to done sometime this week. We'll see. Um, anyway, so yeah, the P cores are at 5 gigahertz and just completely cooling limited. The E cores are at 4 gigahertz, and I don't think they would go any higher. The ring is at 4.2 gigahertz because I tried it at 4.3 and it would blue screen. So um, yeah, that's like everything is just absolute. Like the the thing is like. Your core voltage is basically dictated by the P cores because if you give those too much, like the, the E cores are easy to cool. They really don't pull very much power. They don't really get very hot. Um, they're kind of annoying in that sense where it's like, like, you know, it's like, oh, I really wish we could do more with the E cores, but you can't because if I do anything more than the, because the E cores run off of the same power delivery as the, as the P cores. So if I raise the P core, like E core voltage, it, it's the same thing as raising the P core voltage. So Anyway, so those are just sort of stuck at 4 gigahertz, and the ring is at 4.2, because the ring also runs on the core voltage, on just straight V-core. Anyway, um, in terms of load voltage, we're looking at around 1.206 volts, which uh, doesn't sound like much, because it, well, it isn't much, like, this is a perfectly safe voltage to, to use for long-term operation. Um, as far as I'm concerned, the temperatures are like, well, it's prime 95. Like if you were actually using the CPU in day-to-day -day usage, it would never get this hot. Honestly, prime 95 small FFT stress testing is the kind of thing that you do if you have a system where you require 100% uptime, um, which, yeah, this, this will probably, like, this would probably achieve that, um, in this configuration. And I wouldn't feel like these are unsafe settings in that kind of scenario. Um, but if you were doing this for daily, you could use a slightly less aggressive, like, less, yeah, less difficult stress test and, you know, bring the voltage up to get some more frequency headroom. But, um, like, the thing thing is, Prime95 also puts the highest load on the actual VRM because it pulls the most current at the lowest voltage. Um, and what makes the VRM run really hot is the current draw, not so much the voltage. Like, 200 watts at 2 volts is much easier to do than, like, 200 watts at 1 volt. Um, so, yeah, and that's, like, and also I should note, ah, screw it, if you don't, like, if somebody goes into the comments and asks about how they can raise their voltage without raising the current draw, I am going to ignore that comment, because it's freaking stupid. Uh, anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, so... Uh, VRMs at 80 degrees, though it's worth noting I did max out the VRM switching frequency because the CPU just doesn't pull quite, like, doesn't pull that much power and the VRM was running very cool. Um, if you run the VRM on this board at 500 kilohertz, the, the VRM just, like, I don't think I would, I don't think it was going much over, like, 70 degrees Celsius. Um, and so I decided, well, I've got the thermal headroom, let's just max it all the way out. So the VRM is currently running at a full 1 megahertz switching frequency, and it still is at perfectly acceptable temperatures. So I am uh, slightly upset about that. <laughs> um, and I was really hoping to have like a higher operating temperature so that when we switch to the monoblock, there's more heat to get rid of. But, you know, Z690 motherboard VRMs are kind of mega overkill. So, um, like, yeah, like Z690 motherboard VRMs start with overkill and you know, at the top end, you get mega overkill. It's like not really a practical difference, but there's more components on the higher end ones. Um, anyway, so yeah, that's that's sort of what we have in the system, like in the OS right now. I guess I should show you the idle voltage if we, once we stop the test. So stop the test, it goes up to 1.34 volts and that's, that's like a perfectly acceptable idle voltage to, to sit at. Um, like really, th this is, like, you could da daily this easily. Um, I, I don't see, like, yeah, th this is perfectly fine. This is fine. Like, CPU overclocking really isn't that complicated. It's just, like, make sure the CPU doesn't overheat. Give it enough voltage, and then... Or give it as much voltage as you can cool, and then just keep raising the frequency until it can't run any faster. It is worth noting that raising the frequency does slightly increase the power consumption of the CPU. So, going from, like... Th though, it's very slightly. So, going from, like, 4.9 to 5 gigahertz, you're probably not, like, you shouldn't really see much of a temperature difference, but technically, it does increase the power consumption very slightly. Um, now, if you went from, like, 2 gigahertz to 5 gigahertz, you would really notice that. That actually makes a, like, that's, that pretty much more than doubles your power consumption, so, uh, frequency change like that. Anyway, um, 
So yeah, that's the setup here in the OS. Let's go take a look at the BIOS settings. Um, Oh, I guess I should have mentioned that the ambient temperature in the room is around 21 degrees Celsius right now. So I've just mentioned that. Anyway, so here we are in the BIOS. Um, so P-Core ratio is just set all, uh, all P-Cores to 5 gigahertz, E-Cores to 40. We go to the advanced CPU configuration. Yeah, you can see I raised the temperature limit. There's no reason to do that. It won't be stable if you, like if you end up having to raise the temperature limit, it probably won't be stable anyway. So you may as well not bother with that. Um, then, uh, where is it? Where's the power limit settings? Oh wait, no, MSI puts that on the front page, yeah. This is actually really cool that MSI gives you this setting right here where you can very quickly just flick between the power limits. I really like that compared to some other motherboard vendors where you have to manually go in and max out all the power limits. Um, anyway, ring ratio is at 4.2. I did try 4.3, it wasn't very happy with that. And 4.1 on the E-Cores had a tendency to randomly crash. Um, like it would drop two of the workers in Prime 95, that kind of thing. So that, that's why the E-Cores are at four. Uh, yeah, memory is a JDEC. Like it, this memory kit doesn't even have an XMP profile. The core voltage is set to 1.38 volts, but as you saw, because of the LLC that I'm using, even at idle, the voltage doesn't really get all the way up to 1.38 volts. And the LLC I'm using is mode 5. So, um, yeah, we're technically seeing, like, at full load, we're seeing, what is it, like 180 millivolts of V-Droop? Because it dips down to around 1.206 volt. Well, actually, probably closer to 200 millivolts. Because the thing is, the VCC sense... Actually, this board doesn't even have VCC sense. Ooh, that... Wait a minute. I'm going to have to look into that then. This board doesn't have a VCC sense setting. Very interesting. Anyway, I didn't even notice. But the, the amount of voltage drop the board is seeing is like... It's high enough that I would think that it's VCC sense. I'm going to have to... I'm going to have to check that when, when I get around to like doing the... When I get around to like taking the board apart completely. Um, I'll, I'll, you know, uh, do a quick check of the, how the voltage regulate, uh, like how the voltage monitoring circuitry is set up. Um, because I just kind of assume that it's like all the other MSI boards I've worked with where you just have VCC sense, but, um, maybe I'm on a super ancient BIOS version <laughs> that could also explain that anyway, so, uh, which wouldn't really affect the CPU overclocking anyway. Um, typically BIOS updates only fix, like only really affect memory overclocking if they affect anything. Um, anyway, CPU over voltage protection is maxed out. Switch over current protection is on enhanced. The switching frequency is also completely maxed out. And I'm very happy to say that the switching frequency on this board doesn't do anything weird. Um, so on the MSI Z690 Unify X, if you change the switching frequency, it actually changes your operating voltages. Like it basically seems to reduce the amount of V-droop you're getting, which is super weird. And that shouldn't happen. And it doesn't happen on the vast majority, like, like, the, the Unify X is the first board where I've ever seen that behavior. Um, anyway, on this board, we don't have that. So I'm assuming the whole reason the Unify X does that is because the Unify X uses a Renaissance voltage controller, whereas this board uh, uses a monolithic power systems voltage controller. Um, I also really want to get scope shots of this board because of that monolithic power systems controller. It's not very, like, they're the go-to voltage regulator company for high-end NVIDIA GPUs. Um, and by high-end NVIDIA GPUs, I mean non-reference designs, like Kingpin Editions, Founders Editions, uh, Strix cards, that kind of thing. But anyway, like, so monolithic power systems is kind of common for high-end NVIDIA GPUs. Not really a thing on motherboards, though, with... Well, actually, we see them on the VCC and regulator everywhere now, but eh. Um, you don't usually see them on V-Core. Anyway, so changing the switching frequency on this board doesn't do anything weird to the voltage controls. So, yeah, um, that's why it's completely maxed out, because I also needed the V... I wanted to get the VRM to run a little hotter, considering the CPU just isn't that power hungry. Um, and I guess it's worth noting that, yeah, when I had the switching frequency at 500 kilohertz, the VRM would top out at around 70 degrees Celsius. With the switching frequency completely maxed out, it runs at around a little over 80 degrees Celsius. So, um, yeah, at least with the 12600KF, there's really no reason not to just completely max it out. 
anyway, I don't know that it necessarily makes any difference to the voltage regulation, though, which is why I really want to get the oscilloscope hooked up to this board, but I'm going to be doing that last in terms of testing. I'll probably do the voltage check at the same time. Anyway, the other VRM settings are just set to auto, because um, these are for the over-temperature, which we, like, I'd say don't change that. Um, and then the load line calibration for the auxiliary rail, which I'm not overclocking the memory, so we don't care about the auxiliary rail. Anyway, and everything else is auto, because there's no memory overclock on this. It's literally just CPU settings, so... Yeah, um... So that's kind of, uh, what the 12600 KF can do on an AIO. Uh, I'm really interested to see how it behaves once I move it onto the custom loop. Um, and then also once I have it on the mono block. Um, yeah, that, that'll be interesting. Um, I'm really hoping that it can go higher, uh, without having to resort to liquid metal. Um, because, uh, yeah, because the thing is, like, the 12900K that I have was a similar situation where on the AIO it was like, there's no way it's going over 5 gigahertz all core for Prime 95, and then... With the custom loop and also the liquid metal, we, we really can't forget the liquid metal. It makes a very big difference in, in high heat output scenarios. Um, yeah, that, uh, that, you know, that made it possible for the 12900K to do 5.15 gigahertz in uh, Prime 95. So I'm not sure that, like, I, I don't think without, you know, resorting to using liquid metal that we'll see such a big improvement. But I'm still hoping that even on conventional thermal paste going from an AIO to the custom loop will, you know, allow higher CPU frequencies than what I've been able to achieve so far. So, yeah, anyway. Um, oh, I guess I should have mentioned, the reason, it's funny, the reason I mentioned that this board uses the monolithic power systems voltage controller is that there's like a bunch of MSI motherboards that use exactly this VRM with that same monolithic power systems voltage controller. So if you have one of the other motherboards that uses this VRM design, uh, you can also just max out the switching frequency. There's really no, like, there's there's no downsides to doing that. It doesn't do anything weird to the voltage control, like, voltage regulation. Just max the switching frequency. No, no harm in that. It might help with voltage regulation. We'll, you know, find out with the oscilloscope. Worst case scenario, it, like, my experience with switching frequency settings on high-end motherboards are, like, usually they don't achieve anything, but, you know, that's, like... And as that's as, you know, measured by the oscilloscope. Um, but on, but sometimes uh, it does, well, usually on lower end motherboards. So the, like the Z690-A benefits from having its switching frequency maxed out, but that's because it uses like a really, or I suspect that's because it uses like a rich tech controller, which is probably far more basic than the monolithic power systems or the Renaissance controller that MSI uses on the higher end boards. Um, which would explain why that controller benefits from the switching frequency, whereas at least higher, like, whereas typically high-end boards don't. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, that's kind of it for this video. Man, I was thinking this video would be a lot shorter than it ended up being. I got kind of distracted by all the VRM stuff. Um, I feel like I should have probably done the PCB breakdown first and then everything else, but then that would screw up the thermal pads, whatever. Um... So yeah, kind of a filler video, but hopefully if you have a MSI motherboard with this VRM, this sort of helps you a little bit with CPU settings, maybe, like, at least for, like, a static all-core overclock, um, yeah, which, on a 12600K, or 12600KF, definitely worth it, because the stock boost only goes up to 4.9 gigahertz, so... Yeah, and I'd imagine a lot of CPUs should be able to hit at least 5 gigahertz, though some of them might need more voltage than what I'm using here. So, uh, yeah, actually, probably a lot of them will need more voltage than what I'm using here. But, yeah, anyway, that's it for the video. Thank you for watching. Like, share, subscribe, leave any comments, questions, suggestions down in the comment section below. If you'd like to support what I do here with actually hardcore overclocking, I have a Patreon. There's a link to that down in the description below. There's also the AHOC Teespring store where you can pick up shirts, stickers, posters, you know, the usual YouTuber merch. Both uh, Patreon and Teespring help out immensely with running the channel, so it would be much appreciated if you'd check them out. And that's it for the video, so thanks for watching, and goodbye!